most times chairman at the beginning of a, a lecture will say the speakers no need no introduction and on this occasion it's it's true because of course uh, Miriban and Gunesh have been our hosts for this uh, uh, great series of lectures and have looked after us on each occasion and now to reach the climax they're going to give the the 12th uh, lecture in the series so i'm going to to hand the uh, uh, screen over to uh, miriban who's going to start and she'll be followed later by ganesh miriban okay thank you trevor <clears throat> and hello everyone today it's the last talk of the first round and we have started this series with the aim of listening to different examples of Neolithic from various uh, geographies. Uh, hence, uh, during this boring home confinement period, we have visited more than uh, 10 uh, sites in the last couple of uh, months. And with the second round, we aim at increasing both the number and the variety of uh, examples, sites, by stretching into other geographies, which we haven't yet had the chance to listen to, uh, such as Iran. And today we are in Central Anatolia region. We have been working in Central Anatolia for about 25 years. Previously, we worked in Southeast Anatolia and investigated a community contemporary to Ashikli. Therefore, we had the opportunity to get to know two completely uh, different uh, worlds. Uh, this is how we, our interest in differences had started. So what we have listened throughout this series, uh, alongside with our experience, showed us a few other uh, differences in another dimension which are the approaches and the perceptions between countries and policies regarding the past, prehistory or culture, uh, cultural heritage of a region. This is not our main concern in the series, but it was quite interesting to see the differences in cultural politics or how they reveal uh, themselves. Uh, I will show you a map now uh, of Central Anatolia to explain uh, what I mean by saying differences in poli policies. This is the region we work. Here you see it, Central Anatolia. We have been working for the past 30 years. It is quite a large region. It measures more than 160,000 square meters. And in such a large region, the total number of excavated early Neolithic, that is the transition to early farming, let's say, is only seven. Paleolithic is only known by two excavated sites and Epipaleolithic just one. Those uh, red lozenges uh, show the early Neolithic sites. Two of them, namely Sofular and Sirchalatepe excavations have recently started. Sofular is in the south of uh, the southern arc of Halis, an area that has not been investigated formerly. It's dated to 8 millennium BC. Uh, two preliminary reports have already been published. And there's another one, the second one is uh, Sirchalı Tepe excavations. Uh, it's very close to Kayırlı obsidian sources in Berluda. The site covers uh, likely a residential area and a workshop. And it's also dated to 8 millennium BC, slightly later than Sofular, contemporary with the latest phase of Aşıklı. The third is Balıklı, which you will listen soon, is so what I uh, like to underline is that we are at a very initial stage in understanding the region as a whole. <clears throat> so I start with Ashikla. Uh, the results I will present, uh, needless to say, are the results of our collaborative work. Uh, colleagues from different universities and research centers in Turkey and abroad, uh, participate constantly to the project to whom we are deeply grateful. <clears throat> uh, Ashikla community lived in such an environment 
next to the Melendez River, which forms a favorable micro niche in the steppes of central Anatolia and the volcanic region shaped by volcanoes such as Hasanda. Uh, please note uh, on the slides here how the mount was cut on uh, three sides. I will refer to these sections uh, in a minute. Uh, the earliest inhabitants likely did not come here from remote areas. Most probably they were living in the immediate surroundings and used to come and go in a certain routine. Vinesh will talk about these uh, forager groups lived in the close vicinity. Uh, the recent results of ancient DNA analysis confirmed our prediction that the first inhabitants of Ashikru were a group who had been living in this region together. And on, on the map, you can own in purple dots and the other central Anatolian communities rather than uh, North Levant or elsewhere. <clears throat> we are thankful to the DNA team from Middle East Technical University and Hacettepe and to all the researchers whose names I can't list here. They carry out various projects on genetics and publish their results constantly. And this is also very recently published. Uh, regarding the dates of the arrival of the first groups to Ashikla, as I mentioned uh, in the previous talk of Didier Binder, maybe you remember, there are a few early dates that indicate early 9th millennium BC. However, they all need to be contextualized and restudied. Uh, so for now, we accept uh, the dates as the mid of uh, 9th millennium BC. Uh, the area the first group settled was Melendez River's floodplain. It's a low rise in the, uh, in the plain. And on the slides here, uh, we made a, a sounding. This is the west face of the, of the mound. And here we made a sounding. And number one, that one indicates the alluvial fill. That's the low rise of the fill. And number two indicates the earliest anthropogenic layer. Three is a non-anthropogenic layer, a layer of fine gravel brought by the river. And four is an ashy layer, a burnt layer, which shows again the existence of the humans. <clears throat> and our knowledge on this temporary settlement comes from the west face of the mound cut by the river. It's not possible to expose these uh, early levels elsewhere without removing the, the upper layers. <clears throat> but this long cut, when cleaned, uh, exposed structures and layers of the early settlement. Here, the red arrows uh, indicate the uh, plaster of the, uh, of the uh, big uh, pit. It's a large pit dug into the alluvial fill and then plastered on sides, on uh, walls and on the, uh, on the floor. Here is a close-up of the structure with a multi-plastering of floors here and a colored plastering on the corner of the, uh, of the um, structure and an adult female burial here, which, is, which was uh, almost completely destroyed. <clears throat> And uh, in another part of the west face, we could uh, clean and partially excavate two structures of the early settlement. Here is one. It's burnt. It was burnt. Therefore, the wood construction was very well preserved. And on the slides, you can see the reed phytoliths here, the reed phytoliths of the roof and the uh, the vertically led uh, post, um, the, the posts under the wall plaster. Mm -hmm. However, it's only the um, one fourth of the structure again uh, that's uh, preserved. The other parts were uh, destroyed totally. So this level is the earliest level and it's currently under excavation and study and work on stratigraphical issues and datings uh, continue. 
immediately on top of this level, the year-round settlement begins with its permanent structures and regularly renewed external activity areas. Here you can see the late 9th and early 8th millennium residential buildings and the uh, internal architectural features uh, and burial pits, the central heart here, the post uh, holes here, and the burial pits here and there. <clears throat> uh, during this phase, uh, sheep and goat were kept within the settlement enclosures in enclosures in external areas next to dwellings we have multiple evidences on animal management at ashiklu including in situ dung layers results of the analysis on sex and age isotope and pathologies i will not go in detail we have published them in a volume uh, two years ago so i will just show this chart as a summary a subsistence depended on broad spectrum hunting, including small game, game uh, shown in orange here, <clears throat> fish and birds, caprines in uh, green and cattle. A quite uh, rich variety of wild plants and fruits were collected. They're shown in, uh, in gray. Besides, they cultivated cereals, uh, you can see the, uh, the blue ones uh, symbolize the cereals and pulses uh, indicated in orange. Cereals included emma wheat, both the wild and domestic forms. It's known to be a plant not native to central Anatolia. Pulses include lentils, pea, bitter wedge and chickpea. Among them, chickpea is also a non-local plant. Uh, the community uh, of this period seemingly was dynamic and in contact with non-local groups, just as it was in the previous temporarily settled phase. A Mediterranean shells, a chocolate flint, uh, flint blade, um, are absolutely non-local. Emma continued to be imported, imported uh, constantly through the sequence. We do not know yet if this non-local plant initially was brought to the settlement by others or fetched by uh, Ashiklu community. It's also a question whether a certain degree of importing continued through the occupation besides local cultivation. Now, among the semi-subterranean old buildings of this period, one structure differs from the others. It's used for communal purposes, for food production, for food um, or for communal production. Its size, inner architectural features, the dimensions of the heart, here you see, uh, the bench, uh, the multi-plastered uh, floor and the division in use of internal space differentiates it from the rest of the semi-subterranean buildings. This building symbolizes the collective structure of the midnight community. And here are the data of, our, of this interpretation. If we start with the obsidian tools, they are very few in number. The majority consists of uh, cutting tools. A chemical analysis on calcium, phosphorus, and strontium show concentrations of human activities around the heart here, and a slight division on the floor between north and south. Phytolet analysis always give uh, very, good one, uh, very good results. And here you can see the distribution of cereals, sedges, reeds, and how the space and the architecture features were used. Uh, the special view, uh, distribution of archaeobotanical remains suggest intense use of the building for plant processing as well as uh, food preparation. And archaeobotany confirms the distinction uh, between the north and south parts of the building. 
e, none of those residential buildings of the same phase had such significant differentiation. An interesting find comes from the uh, pit shown by, uh, by the red arrow. Uh, this large pit had functioned as a base for a large basket, and the basket likely contained cereals or pulses. And interesting was the 200, uh, 279 clay balls that were placed uh, inside the, the, the basket to absorb uh, the probable moisture. It's a method known ethnographically. A prominent feature of this building is its reconstruction on the same spot. Here you can see uh, the renewed walls, um, one uh, inside uh, each of the, uh, one inside the other. Uh, reminding the uh, uh, Matryoshka dolls. Here, here you can see it again. Uh, they, they are at least six or seven times renewed on the same spot. Uh, we know that before the abandonment of this building, uh, it was completely emptied. The pits on, uh, on the bench were sealed with carriage blocks and the pits used for storage were unloaded. Uh, strikingly and importantly, the practice that involved emptying and closing was not unique to this building. A major reorganization was made all over the settlement. And this reorganization included leveling in open areas where animals were kept previously, here you see, this is the, the level uh, of uh, the, the leveling layer, let's say. And transportation of animals outside the settlement. Construction of above ground rectangular houses. Change in living level, uh, where roof level became the new uh, living level. Terracing made by gravel deposits and an uh, addition of a new area and the construction of, uh, of the special purpose buildings complex on this new area and the renewal of buildings on the same spot as you hear, as you see here, uh, which, uh, which looks like a social rule. After this leveling or cleaning, we do not see any penning areas or enclosures or thick accumulation of dung layers in the settlement. Here on this slide, the colored parts indicate the inclination and the limit of the early settlement that dates to, uh, to the mid 9th millennium. The reorganization include, uh, included the terracing activity here on south, here, where a new area was added. Here you can see the new area, if you, if you can follow my, uh, my arrow. Uh, and uh, this was for the construction of the special purpose buildings. And this terracing was done by, by those uh, gravel deposits. I mentioned that another change was, uh, was the living surfaces. All buildings were above ground in this uh, new phase. The roof level became the new living surface and trees were from the roof. Uh, this new elevation was a change but the concept of entering the buildings from above was not new. It was the way the people entered the subterranean buildings previously. And rectangular plan became a rule and oval buildings completely disappeared. This was also not a sudden change. Rectangular plans were used together with the oval ones in the previous levels, but they were very few in number. What needs to be underlined is all these changes, internal and gradual. There was no gap. There were no external inputs, no sudden changes. In other words, the community accepted changes without making compromises on continuity. 
this uh, continuity phenomenon is best visible in architecture and in obsidian technologies as well. For example, in the continuous use of microliths or the continuation of unidirectional methods, all seem typical for central Anatolia. And the repetition in buildings or the repeated reconstruction of buildings on top of the old ones symbolize the community's absolute commitment to the past in household scale. In other words, it symbolizes collective history and indicates the collective structure of the community. The intense and heavy workload during the, this reorganization period must have required the attention and effort of the whole community to focus on the maintenance of this reorganization. Although we are currently working on the duration of each building and calculating how often the houses were uh, renewed, we can estimate that each generation was somehow involved with rebuilding and renewing their houses or contributing to the communal activities such as the continuous raising of the gravel uh, terracing um, or the rebuildings in the communal area or of animal management herding that required full-time effort. And this a settlement oriented way of living lasted for more than 500 years. And changes in social aspects and community behavior came during the second half of the eighth millennium, two or 300 years before the abandonment of the settlement. The community continued on keeping its collective character However, slight signs of, of differentiation appeared. If we summarize these, the, the changes, around 7,500 building groups and neighborhoods appeared for the first time. Stable nitrogen values showed a slight difference, a variation in diet among households. Double barriers appeared for the for first time. However, they are, they are quite rare. We only had two examples. Uh, personal ornaments, mostly beads, began to appear often in, the, in burial pits. Reconstructions were made in the special purpose buildings complex. And last not least, sheep and goat were domesticated. So when we assess through the thousand years of habitation history at Ashıklı, we see that there were two major changes. The first major change was due to the transportation of the Caprins out of the settlement. This decision or necessity gave way to new special and architectural organizations within the settlement while it reinforce the collective character of the community. The second change came together with the domestication of sheep and goat uh, during the last phase of the habitation. This change had two significant impacts. The first was on the social structure of the community. We see the first signs of social differentiations and likely the arising conflicts, domestic animals, their production processes, and the production surplus might have caused some differentiations, inequalities, probably conflicts or disputes within the community. The reorganization in the special purpose buildings, that's the construction of, the, of this building, of this T building, was at that time, Ceremonies and feastings were held in this area and they likely served for relieving the newly arising conflicts within the community and reinforcing the collective structure and sustaining the support, the, the spread of communality likely became more important than ever. <clears throat> and this complex held uh, activities including gatherings, and meetings, 
and feasting, contrary to the special uh, semi-subterranean building of the late ninth millennium, where food preparation and food production were the main motivation for the unity or for the, for the community gathering. Uh, the second impact of the domestication was on community behavior. Interaction and exchange restarted. Some non-local items were introduced starting around 7,500. Decorated shaft straighteners and symbolic objects first appeared in this phase. However, they were st still very rare. <clears throat> this is almost all what we have uh, as non-utilitarian finds. And uh, obsidian bracelet of East Anatolian origin, uh, Mediterranean shells, uh, textiles, copper beads, all arrived to the side in finished forms in this last phase. A locally domesticated sheep and goat seem to be one of the exchange items in this mutual uh, interaction. And ancient DNA results provided by Joris Peters seem to confirm this, where uh, maternal lineages identified at Ashirkli are well represented in modern populations of Anatolian and European uh, sheep. So the pull or the push factor for the early groups to come and settle at Ashikla still needs further study. That's the earliest level. However, the animal and human interaction, in our case, uh, caprings and human interaction, all through the habitation history, likely had a prominent role in transition from foraging to sedentism. Thank you. Uh, Ganesh will present now uh, what was happening uh, 15 kilometers away. And uh, this is, yeah, that's my last slide. And I'm going to stop sharing it now, Ganesh. So, uh, Mirvan mentioned this uh, at the beginning, but I would like to repeat once more uh, in a different context. Uh, we generally try to understand neolithization uh, through diffusion and migration and by looking at the uh, dots on the map. But the rise example in this series uh, have already indicated that there are many different Neolithic life ways. The scarcity um, of res research is a, is a problem uh, in the assessment of earlier periods and communities in central Anatolia. We know very little, know, uh, little about the story uh, of the uh, region, especially before Ashikla. Uh, one of the possible reasons for this might be the early Christian settlements in Cappadocia. It is very likely that early Christian communities uh, chose uh, locations uh, uh, similar to those that the uh, epipaleolithic groups preferred uh, for their settlements, the rock cut uh, spaces typical of Cappadocia. Another reason must be the intensive erosion uh, in this region caused by wind. We can observe uh, the effect of uh, wind erosion uh, even today. The old village of Kazilkaya has been washed away uh, and completely covered by erosion uh, within three to uh, 220 hundred years, uh, despite its stone architecture. Additionally, although they are um, rare in this region, some epileptic cave and terrace settlements have been found around central Anatolia, such as Kuzuni, Pınarbaşı, Avlada, directly and recently identified sites uh, of uh, Eşek Deresi Marası, north of Mersin. In fact, we know, well, through the indirect evidence of exchange of obsidian between Cappadocia and distant location that late Pleistocene and epipolitic entities have been the region for uh, 30 or 40,000 years. 
there has been continuous transmission of knowledge about obsidian resources for millennia among people who need the resource location, the suppliers and the nappers. But uh, both uh, locals, uh, Central Anatolia, uh, locals of Central Anatolia and communities from the Levant were part uh, of this transmission. In any case, even though uh, obsidian resources are not very visible, they have long been known uh, by the communities here. Thus, obsidian resources and workshop play a key role in understanding the early sedentary groups in the region. However, at present, we can only detect these communities when they settle next to the river banks or wetland areas. In light of this, um, and in need of different voices and thoughts, we invited Nigel Gordon Morris to work with us and we planned a survey together and uh, within the region. So in first year of uh, the survey project, we discovered Middle Paleolithic, Epipaleolithic and Neolithic sites. One of, um, one of our discoveries, which we found uh, on the first week of the, of the survey was Balıklı. Balıklı measures uh, 120 by 120 meter and is uh, between and two and five meter in height. It is most likely a short-term settlement and may have only been occupied on seasonal basis as suggested by some indication in the archeozoological data. Natural clay near the site can uh, be shaped while it is west. However, it becomes very hard, almost like concrete, when it dries. The freshwater resources and volcanic rocks and reeds along the wetland must have also attracted the Balıklı community to this place. Uh, the Nenezi obsidian, uh, Nenezi and Gölüda obsidian sources lie 6 and 20 kilometers away, respectively. The available C14 dates give a range of and 8,250, uh, 7,950 uh, uh, before Christ. Uh, the vertical stratigraphy is not that long. Our preliminary observation uh, indicate a dense settlement pattern consists of buildings uh, adjacent to each other. Understanding the chronological relationship between these buildings will be possible once the number of excavated buildings and open spaces increasing and will help to us understand whether this was a periodically visited site or if it was a permanent settlement that was occupied for a short period of time. Just after we discovered Balıklı, announced the site and registered uh, with the local museum, uh, the site was illegally excavated with a bulldozer in three areas. We immediately started the excavation to avo avoid further destruction. After three seasons of field work, we can only, uh, we can now say that a, com a community who lived at Balıklı was totally different than the contemporary community who occupied the early levels of Oshikla. The first and the most significant indication of this is the architecture. The building material, the types of building and internal architectural features are completely different than at Oshikla. Buildings uh, six uh, to four uh, are five uh, in the diameter. Semi-subterranean structures constructed from stones, mainly basalts, marsh, clay, and reeds. They are oval, even uh, ovoid in shape. Pardon. Okay. Except for one structure, uh, which is built uh, almost uh, at ground level and might have been used for storage purposes. All the other structures are very similar to each other. They were built inside large pits dug into the ground. Uh, their orientation form and architectural features design are almost identical to one another. Most of the buildings also have 
have an absolute uh, projection directed outwards and towards the east. We see evidence for the such rules uh, um, in the organization of space inside the buildings, for instance, a rather large fireplaces. Clay boxes and features uh, that are fixes, uh, fixed in the floor and enclosed by stones, as well as post holes and mortars uh, are also presented inside the buildings. While cleaning one of the profile of the illegally dug pits, we found a skeleton buried under the first earliest of repeatedly renewed building floor. It was partly destroyed by the bulldozer. You can follow here uh, renewed uh, floors of the building. We also found three additional skulls and some vertebra fragments uh, just beneath the skeleton. The skulls were buried together along with a piece of ochre in the shape of a cube, the obsidian blocks, fragments of obsidian with trays of ochre to polished hand axes and elaborately verb bundles. So this mortuary practice is completely different than Ashikva. Ultimately, we postpone our work in this area, and we thought that it would not pos be possible to understand the skeleton context uh, without excavating the whole building properly. We don't know if these were some sort of foundation burials. So we also identify complete individuals buried inside a deep pit stuck into the building floors. One of them was buried in an upright sitting position which let us think that the skulls we found the first year uh, could well be buried, uh, buried in, in a similar position. Because of the pandemic uh, and the lack of time, and we had to pos postpone the excavation of this upright sitting and skeleton. So what we know concerning secondary use of buildings at Balitli also comes from burials. All of the dead were placed inside pits dug into the deteriorate walls of the old and abandoned buildings. Uh, one of the example here, uh, three individuals buried into the same building field. The heads of the skeletons face uh, east in all examples. The individual were uh, buried in a, a semi-flex position. The ribs and vertebra of the young adult male you see here were colored with ochre. A small ochre block was also found between his ribs and left arm. Two bead groups were found uh, with the skeleton. The first was located around the skull and neck and the second was found around the left wrist. Both groups consist of small stone beads that are covered or overpainted with the ochre. A blade and fragments of what might be a malachite are among the most striking findings we unearthed uh, with this uh, young adult male. The blade and 20 centimeter in length was made of chocolate flint and contain trace of ochre or cinnabar on this lower end. So it's especially the uni, uh, shell, uni shell uh, are quite fragile. Ochre combined with some additives could have been used for strengthening the beads and to keep beat group, uh, groups uh, intact. This hypothesis could related to its paste-like appearance. Uh, also, there's, there's a possible symbolic aspect and coloring purposes. The copper working method was likely similar to what we know from Ashikla and involved heating and pounding. However, our analyzing clearly indicate the exploitation of the different sources at Balikla uh, than at Ashikla. The tight packed shoulder and arms of another individual buried in the same building field indicates that the body was tight before being placed 
in the burial pit. Two sets of beads, uh, one around the neck and the other around the uh, waist and legs were found with the body. The beads around the neck were made of small stone that were partially uh, painted with ochre. The beads around the waist were made from freshwater shells uh, painted with ochre and uh, surrounded the individual's waist like a belt. We had encountered similar shells in the previous years in the same area, but uh, as surface finds. The stains of ochre on the bones suggest that small fragments of, of ochre were scattered over certain limbs, uh, limbs uh, of the, uh, this individual. So most of the plant remains at Balıklı were preserved by carb carbonization. Cereals are pulses are present, uh, but in small numbers. Uh, cereals are mainly represented by glumes uh, of or chaff, uh, which suggested that the husking uh, took place to a certain degree. At least some of these could be identified as MR wheat and uh, or as MR type gloom wheat. Pulses are generally badly preserved. Only one seed uh, could be identified as lentil. It is not possible yet to discuss the plant-based uh, substance strategies and scale and nature of cultivation at the site, nor uh, the domestication processes of the potential crops plants. More samples and ongoing research will provide uh, further information. Hackberry fruits, stones preserved by mineralization are also common uh, in the assemblage. Other fruits um, or nut remains are too fragmented to, uh, al uh, to allow further indication, except for some specimens which likely uh, belong to Terambai, uh, the wild pistachio. Uh, wild are uh, also generally rare, um, still uh, the combine and the plant assemblage reflects an, an environment with both uh, drylands and wetlands. Regarding the archaeozoological remains, uh, thus far uh, about 1,000, 1000 faunal remains have been uh, identified. The sample is large enough to provide some interesting comparison with other uh, Neolithic sites in Central Anatolia. Of these, uh, the sample from Balıklı is most similar to the lowest level at Ashiklahu, especially in the high representation of small game animals like hares, which are not shown here, but make up more than one uh, third of the assemblage. The, combi uh, the composition, composition of uh, the anglinates anglin uh, uh, is all also most similar to uh, layer five at a ship. Toad assemblage uh, diverse uh, significant, sig significantly uh, the, in the uh, abundance of acutes, which are unusually common uh, at Balakla. So interestingly, very young acute teeth uh, including uh, those from neonates are common at Balıklı and indicate at minimum a late spring or summer occupation. The abund abundance of acutes uh, um, may hint at more engagement in hunting at Balıklı than at Ashiklı, where the early stage of animal management are clearly arrested, even in the lower most layers. The status of animal management is a central topic for continent investigation at Balıklı, but the first requires the identification of a large sample of captains. Obsidian is by far uh, the most common raw material found in the prof profuse uh, Balıklı chipstone industry. Uh, sourcing studies uh, began with microscopic color and texture analyzing and more than 10,000 obsidian artifacts. They revealed that the majority, uh, uh, like 90% of the raw materials is the transparent obsidian known from 
Yoluda, uh, roughly is 20 kilometer distance from the site. Uh, this two persons of opaque and semi-opaque greenish obsidian derives from Nenezida sources, which are much, much closer, uh, like six kilometer to Balukli. Technological analyses indicate that all elements of the napping process are present, present at Balukli. These include thick and thin flakes with natural surfaces, uh, opening platforms, blades with nat natural surfaces and crested blades, as well as the regeneration flakes, blades uh, and tablets and attest to intensive on-site napping. The tools are predominantly from blades and blade list. They include a truncated blade and blade list backed blade and blade list, point, uh, pointed blade and blade list, uh, retouch, retouch blade and blade list, microlithic forms such as tri uh, triangles and elongated uh, lunates, as well as um, smaller size version of the tools made uh, on blades. Tools um, on flakes are less numerous than those blades. Pardon. The high microburian index uh, indicates the widespread use of uh, these techniques in the production of microlithics, uh, microliths, uh, and some tools, notched flakes uh, and splintered pieces uh, are also presented by tray. Uh, of consider considerable interest is the presence of number distinctive projectile point type at Balutla. Uh, these points are uh, asymmetric, single shoulder and tent. <clears throat> they are almost identical to two items found, uh, found in the uh, basal levels at Jaferhui on the uppermost part of the middle Euphrates, where uh, they were defined as Jafar point by Marie Claire Coven. Although only two were recovered at Jafar, they are quite numerous at uh, Balukla. So the result from Balukla show that although this community is uh, contemporary with Ashikla, early occupation and located only 15 uh, kilometer northeast uh, of the settlement, it is very different settlements and communities in central Anatolia, such as Ashikla, Balıklı and Boncuklu show completely different characteristics from each other. There may have been a certain degree of interaction. However, uh, its scale couldn't uh, have been similar to what we observe in the Levant or in Southeast Anatolia. The communities in Central Anatolia were clearly quite independent and may even indifferent uh, in their in engagement in a community dynamics, such as competition and interaction, especially compared to their uh, Eastern neighbors who had a more homogeneous and faster developing culture. A few days ago, we listened to uh, Didier, uh, who talked about the Nepers at Golida and its surroundings and described uh, the interaction of their technologies and exchange over long distance. We also saw this particular example that communities in Central Anatolia are fairly close uh, to interaction with outsiders, uh, even though both sides were aware of the other use the same resources and must have met. So to conclude, although uh, it has been investigated only the last three years, there are many questions that needed uh, to be answered regarding the Balukla itself. Also regarding Balukla interaction with the neighbors uh, in a regional scale. The question include the settlement characteristic, duration and its role within the obsidian resources and network beside the symbolic world, uh, cosmology of their inhabitants. So regarding the Ashikla, we made significant uh, process throughout the long years of research at the site. However, 
questions, especially on social, symbolic, and behavioral attitudes of the community formation of identities, uh, social differentiation, and cognitive issues need further fine scale research. Developing methods uh, to investigate these and also finding methods to excavate the earliest levels without excavating uh, the top levels are features objective. So I would like to thank also uh, the member of Balukle and Ashikle team. I would like to thank is Nigel Gorin Morris. Uh, we, we are very, very happy to uh, join. Uh, he, he joined us and we try to understand all together Central Anatolian Naval Station. Thank you very much. Your microphone, Trevor, sorry. Do I see any hands in the air for questions? I'm not seeing any hands in the air. Oh, yes, I do. Daniela, please, yes. Hi, do you hear me? Yes. yes. Oh, good. Um, sorry about the noise in the background. That's my grandchildren. <clears throat> um, uh, just a quick question to Miriban. You said about that um, uh, flax, uh, fabric, flax textile, that it is important, imported. Is it, is flax, does flax not grow in Turkey? As far as I know, uh, Muge can help us, uh, Daniela, but as far as I know, flax is not native to central Anatolia. I mean, it, the, we have it in, in East Anatolia or Southeast, uh, but not in uh, central Anatolia. So that's why we think that it's a, in some kind of an import. Uh, and since we do not have any uh, working uh, or any, any evidence for uh, weaving or, or any other evidence about that cloth, we think that it could have been brought as a, as a cloth. Muge, can you help me? <laughs> with the origin of the flags. Um, no. And hi, Muge, so nice to see you. Yes, so nice to see you too. Hi. So um, I don't have further things to add, um, but in Central Anatolia, as um, mentioned, uh, we don't have flags, uh, neither at the site at Ashiklu. We don't find the seeds um, from earlier or later levels. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. I think Hans, 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 you have your, your hand up, please, Hans, go ahead with your question. Yes, hello. Oh, uh, Mehriban, I have a question to you. Uh, questions coming from the Safan Levant, uh, because you have very astonishing findings, at least for us, this, spa uh, this uh, spatial continuity or fixation. For instance, if you have a herf, uh, which don't change its location over two and a half uh, uh, meters, or you have 10 times renewed uh, uh, um, a floor over four meters. Um, what are, what are the, 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 the so, what is your social interpretation for such a stability and even spatial fixation? Oh. Uh, not, uh, not social, but uh, physical. You mean? Yeah, it's 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 physical, uh, right? Um, yeah. But also, I mean, if if uh, nothing is changing in a household uh, over such a long distance, I don't know about time. Of course, um, uh, this is the stability which reflects also a, a, a social situation, I guess. Well, it's difficult to say about the stability of the of the buildings, but as far as we have experienced, and, uh, each building was renewed probably uh, in uh, in twenty five years or so, and when it was renewed, it was cut down for uh, down for a certain uh, level. 
uh, and that level was used as the foundation of the other one, right? So from time to time, they used one of the walls as it is, but the other wall as a, found, uh, as a foundation, probably it's because of the uh, of reinforcing the, the, or fixing the, the, the walls. Mm -hmm. I... So you mean so you mean it's it's a, a practical affair where the hearth is not changing over such a long period over so over so many generations. Um, oh, it's not reflecting any any social or no issue. no 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 I don't no, I don't say that no it is it absolutely has some implications on the continuity of the. Uh, of the uh, lineage, or of the uh, uh, of the family of the family groups, yeah. uh, it's, it's something like the the, the building up the uh, collective history of the. Uh, of yeah, yeah. Okay. It okay. it surely has a social impact or a social implication. Uh, but for the physical, uh, that's difficult to, to say. I really uh, don't yeah. have much to yeah. say Thank about you. it. Thank you, Michaela. Thank you. Thank you. There's another hand raised to, to, there. Please, yes, go ahead. Unmute your microphone. Yes. <laughs> uh, I I'm so interested with your basket within the pit. And you finally show the sun-dried clay balls within the pit. So it's, it was fascinating um, finding. So can you tell a little more about the height uh, of the pit and the basket, what it looks like? I'm so excited. Um. Uh, Fisundrum, uh, the thing is, uh, we found it uh, the year before last. Mm -hmm. uh, we could, no, even last year, I think, I think last year. Anyway, I mean, we were not working uh, fully on the, on the site. We just uh, opened the pit and we have seen the traces of the basket. And as soon as we have seen them, they, they, we, we didn't want to, to um, clean it, to expose it, to open it, and we just left it as it is. So you are very welcome to open it, to <laughs> clean it, to <laughs> excavate it. If you like, we do it together. It's on the site again. Uh, those pieces were just the small pieces uh, that, that came out by themselves um, and it's there. Uh, the, we, we emptied the, the, uh, the pit. Uh, when we emptied the pit, we could see the, the phytolates of the basket on the wall. So we just mm -hmm. left it as it is, but emptied it and took out those clay balls. Yeah, what was the height about? Ah, the, the, the height was um, about 40 centimeters, I guess, or 50 oh. centimeters. Uh, and the, the, um, the diameter, it's old actually, it's not round, uh, but it's about, uh, about a meter or so. Uh, yeah. Midis, do you remember the dimensions? Midis should be here somewhere, she dug it. I think it was more more than sixty centimeter. Wow! The height, you mean? No, no. Ah, the di diameter I was more than sixty. Yeah. So yeah. it looks like a thunder, uh, kind of. Uh, it's less uh, forty centimeters, of course, not that uh, deep, but uh, the uh, the round and oval site is really fascinating uh, finding. Yes. So hopefully next year I'll come while you are digging. <laughs> Please do that. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, Douglas, would you have a question? Abala, thanks for the great talk, Miraban and Ganesh. Um, so I just wanted to pick up on what um, Ganesh was uh, positing about the, you know, this really intriguing set of differences between two sites that are fairly proximate. 
um, but relatively relatively different in a whole um, group of ways. And of course, we've got a very analogous situation, as you mentioned, between Bunjuklu and Punabasha. And um, Ganesh, you suggested that you know one um, underlying factor in this might be you know moderate, only moderate level interactions between the the communities. And, and obviously that's a, a distinct possibility. I scratch my head about this very issue, obviously in, in the Konya plane, but what about the, the other possibility of, you know, distinctive and emphasized assertions of different group identities? I mean, do you, can you think of ways that we can, we can tell whether this really relates to limited interaction or deliberate assertion of difference? Um, I think very good question and also a key question to understand Central Anatolia, Douglas. Uh, we we uh, work in Ashikli more than almost in 30 years. And so Ashikli itself, something like, you know, the community built itself, uh, different story than uh, Tigris and Euphrates. There are a kind of uh, cumulative or uh, different groups, they build all together uh, homogeneous cultures, but in Ashikli we have very isolated, they all, they, I mean, uh, they, something like they, they create themselves, you know, and they developed uh, with their knowledge and, and uh, uh, their uh, potential. So, but when we, we try to explain them and each conference and each paper, this isolation, but it's very difficult to explain and without any cases. Uh, we have we have, we have differences with uh, the Bonjukli and Ashikli, but we have a distance. You know, uh, we can we can say that is different kind of different and cultural uh, regions. You know, uh, as we use many times in understand for for. Uh, uh, for uh, uh, understanding for neoliberalization nearest. So when we found in Balitla, so uh, we, we uh, this time we, uh, we, we can say, uh, yes, uh, that people, some, for some reason, they are really uh, very disconnect, you know, uh, very less interaction. If we compare to Tigris, if we compare to and the Euphrates, if we compare any other regions. We, we have many examples from Jordan, for example, different, very, very close and there's sites and it's TTNA, but there are different. Uh, but uh, for some reason, uh, maybe it's politically is a short time. Uh, I mean, something like 100, 200 years occupation, but Ashikla, just think about Ashikla, almost thousand years, they are really, uh, if you remember the DDA's talk last week, you know, uh, in Ashikli communities, they are living uh, uh, in obsidian uh, oasis, something like, you know, they, 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 but they, they don't want to interact with, uh, uh, in a quotation, is a Neolithic core. I mean, uh, they, they probably, <clears throat> I don't know the reason, but we, no one knows probably, but it must be, uh, something related for past, I don't know, or some kind of uh, social uh, differentiation or they are really different. They don't like others. I don't know, very difficult question. Yeah, sorry, <laughs> but you know, as you gathered, I wrestled yeah. with it as well. Yeah, they, I mean, obviously as Miraban's point said and Hans Georg's question prompted, I mean, there, obviously there's quite a lot of evidence of quite historical rootedness in place for many of these sites, at least for the Basha, Bunjukli, or Shukla. I guess I'm not sure how you feel about Balukli yet, but you know, you're right, that is a very interesting dimension of, of them, the historical tradition of the community in those locations. We are unhappy they are moderate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you know, the nice thing about some of the isotope results we got from Bunjukli and Punabash is to show that, seems to show that people were moving between these communities still. So there were, directly people who want, uh, appear to have gone from one to another or must have been in direct mm -hmm. interaction. And it is interesting how, you know, the, the sort of the central Anatolian gene pool seems yeah. 
continue yeah. as well. So I, know, think, I think the assertion of identity must be part of it, but maybe it's a subtle mix. I mean, you know, it's, for example, it's really intriguing how Nenazi is so close to Balukla, but they don't seem to be using a lot of that obsidian, you know, um, and the yeah. Bajukla and Punabash obsidian sources are, are somewhat different from each other, although both yeah. have quite a lot of Guludar, um, unsurprisingly, you know. Anyway, I'll, I'll shut up and let there's plenty of other people uh, asking questions. So thanks very much for that. Okay, I've got three other questions. Uh, there's a lady, GTSAR, who I don't uh, um, recognize on this little postage stamp picture, but unmute and go ahead, please. Yeah, yeah, that's me. Uh, I just wanted to add something about the basket that uh, Fusuner Dug asked. Uh, and Mihriban said that we excavated at the last uh, time, last moment of uh, two years ago, I think, Mihriban. That could be. Uh, yeah, so uh, the lovely piece that you gave me and I put under the scanning electron microscope, I saw the phytoliths and they were reeds, of course, as always. And uh, there was also a wooden part of it as a base of the basket. And Maria Andinu, the anthropologist, recognized it as a common ash. So this was a big and solid basket with a very strong base made of wood and wrapped with, uh, with uh, reeds, which that justifies the fact that we have all these clay balls inside. You need a rigid basket to do that and the wood verifies it. That's what I wanted to say. Yeah, thank you. That's true. The, the sample, you, you had already the sample yeah. analyzed, so it should be two years ago. That's yeah, right. I was lucky to be there the last uh, day. That that's you found right. It. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> uh, Kadyush, you have your hand raised, but you could like to Yeah, so it. thank you. I was really great. Oh, thank you so much. And I've learned a lot, particularly about Balikli, the first time I've, I've heard so much about his site. And, and I have a question to Miraban about this major transition, you know, between uh, level five and four and then three and two. And how do you sort of, do you have an idea of why the change happened and why they were so pronounced and whether this the kind of major shift in the development of, of the sequence has something to do with abandonment of, of Balikli? Because I, as far as I sort of notice the dates that the Gunesh gave and you provided, are more or less the same, the same, the, the beginning of the eighth millennium, am I right? And can you kind of link these two things together, abandonment of Balikli and the major change at Ashikli, and how would you explain this? Uh, thank you, Arek. Uh, we didn't, or let, let's, let me say, I didn't think of uh, the the second option, actually, I mean, I, I, whether there is a relation between the abandonment of Bolukle and the change in uh, Shikle, that that we really didn't think of it. It needs to be, but uh, I mean, the abandonment of Bolukle could be a little late or a little early. I mean, the. the we need, we need some more dates from Balukla, first of all. <clears throat> and uh, so that I cannot answer. I mean, you're- yeah, 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 something. Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, I, yeah. I, I, I agree with uh, Mirban. I think it's, uh, it's not related with uh, the Balukla, uh, but maybe Zemeri can uh, answer as much better than me. I think it, it could be related with that change, uh, animal domestication or animal management scale, let's say, a uh, use of space and also uh, uh, populi uh, po uh, there, there, there's a demographic change and, and we can follow all the uh, okay. layers and medium increasement, something like that. But I think it's Mary uh, can lit, uh, explain much better yeah. than me. Ganesh, I didn't, I didn't reply to the first question. Just a moment. Okay. <laughs> I mean, uh, I, I just said that I, I have no idea about uh, the, the, rep the answer of the second question. Okay. And the first one, the transition from, uh, yeah. uh, from uh, the ninth millennium to the eighth millennium, oh. yes, there is a change. There is a major change. And that major change, as I told, uh, includes uh, mainly the transportation of the animals out of the settlement. 
And the reason, uh, we are not sure about that reason, but the but one of it could be um, hygienic, for example, hygienic um, uh, problems, issues that uh, that that cannot that is not visible actually on any of the uh, skeletons or or any other uh, any other thing. Uh, but there is and th there seems to be an increase in the population that's for sure uh, at that level we see in uh, the clustering of the buildings uh, actually we read all the the story all the um, data from the from the architecture at Ashikla. that's the best uh, and the well preserved thing so the architecture says that there is an increase in uh, in population, so this could well be another reason why of the of the replacement of the animals out of the um, out of the settlement. Um, I'm sure Mary will say something more. <laughs> Hello, Mary, and thanks that you you joined. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, Juan Ho has. Had his, uh, has been requesting the possibility of asking a question for some time. Yeah, and then uh, behind him, there's Didier, and then it's you, Mary. So there's three in a row. Juan Ho first. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mirivana and Gunis. Um, my question is about the stratigraphy and the renewal of the houses. Uh, my question is uh, are the, the, the houses renewed uh, all at the same time, to, all together, or individually? And if this uh, uh, question changes from the uh, basal layer to the upper layer, or uh, it's, uh, 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 it's a, a communal decision to, to renew the site or just uh, individual houses, uh, and how this question changes through the stratigraphy of the site. Uh, Juan, the re renewal of houses, <clears throat> the renewal of buildings uh, during the ninth, the, the late ninth millennium or midnight millennium settlement <clears throat> is uh, less than, or um, how to say, it's uh, it, the ninth millennium uh, buildings, let me say, were renewed twice or a uh, maximum three times. Uh, but you have seen the eight millennium building and it is uh, 10 times on the same spot. Uh, the, the hearts even uh, had the same locations. So the renewal and the continuity becomes a, a rule in the eight millennium. Uh, but in, in the ninth millennium, in the early levels, it is um, except the special building that I have shown you, the others are for uh, repairment. It, it looks like repairments or renewals, but the, the two, the, the, symbol, the symbolization of this uh, collective memory, let's say, or the, the uh, commitment to the past symbolizes in the special building in the ninth millennium and then in household level everywhere in uh, the eighth millennium but those renewals are not contemporary i mean uh, all the houses in all levels they're not uh, renewed at the same time but uh, but it's a it's a uh, it's a very, uh, how to say, um, rule. it became a strict rule in the 8th millennium, let me say. Okay, Didier, uh, would you take the next question? It's a short, just a short uh, question. First of all, thank you, Mirabhan and Ganesh. It was marvelous. And uh, the, the quality of the preservation of the settlements is incredible, and the quality of, of the excavation, too. Thank you. Thank you very much. I have just a question concerning this uh, chocolate flames that you found in level five in Ashikla and also in Balakla. And uh, first, do you have an idea of the origin of this uh, chocolate flames? 
And second, do you have an idea of the napping techniques? Because as far as I have seen, uh, it seems that the in, in Balakla, the um, it's a it's a long blade, no, isn't it? Very regular, very um, prismatic one. So it, it uh, suggests different uh, uh, ways for, of napping, including level pressure. Maybe I don't know. Do you have an idea of the of the situation here? Yes, but I think it's Nurjan can be here. Uh, uh, it... uh, let, let me let me just uh, tell about the sources. We didn't have any uh, source analysis for the flint, but since chocolate flint is so uh, significant for East Anatolia, <laughs> uh, it, I think it uh, it has its root in east or southeast Anatolia, and for the techniques uh, of the um, of this uh, flint blade uh, at Ashukla in level five, uh, I think we published it in the book, didn't we? It's a bipolar. I... It's a bipolar one, which is um, which is completely different for Ashukla for this level. Bipolar appears, as far as I know, appears at the very end of the uh, of the sequence uh, and in very uh, small wind number. I mean. ee, ben mm, Balıklı'daki şeyi söyleyeyim isterseniz. Evet. Ha, ha, <gülüyor> haydi diye. Ee, e, Balıklı's e, flint e, blades. It's the mm, e, I think it's pressure technique. E, it's a, a standing position e, according to the e, Jacques Pellegrin's e, work. E, so it's the, e, the long of the e, blade is nearly e, e, 17 e, centimeter. So it's pressure. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Okay, can we turn to uh, Marion and then follow, sorry, to Mary first and then on to Marion. And before uh, Mary starts, can I just say one of the most wonderful things about this uh, series is that unlike a normal conference where perhaps you have five minutes to discuss a paper, here we are having a wonderful time going uh, on and on and on with our discussions. I'm sorry for uh, Miriban and, and uh, <laughs> my goodness that they have to answer so many questions, but it's really, really, very, very useful. Mary, sorry, Mary. Uh, yes, uh, well, I was only going to offer a couple of points of clarification in support of what Gunesh and um, Mirhiban have already said, which they did so clearly. One is that um, regarding the, the kind of the, the change in the, the funnel record at the end of the Asyukla series, we, um, you know, Caprines just continue to become ever more important in the diet up all the way through to the very end of the sequence. And yet um, we do have very clear infilling, architectural infilling on the mound, which tells us that the animals are being moved off the mound. But we also have chemical evidence that um, the um, uh, rate of accumulation of urine salts really starts to go down too, which indicates that the animals are being moved off. But meanwhile, they're ever more important in the diet and, and that's evident from the bones in the middens. Um, th the other thing is that when, when we talk about, you know, human interaction and, and, and so on, um, obviously what our evidence is really coming from the responsiveness of material culture. And uh, to, to Doug's point, it's, it's almost certainly the case that these people were very aware of each other's presence in nearby. But the, what we've mostly been observing is this very strong conservatism in the material culture, independently of whether these people are trading or you know, uh, at least know that each other are present. So they're, they're maintaining probably um, strong identities, at least expressed in material culture. That's all. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Now, before I ask Marion to, to take her question, can I just say that uh, don't go away when the last question has been uh, answered uh, because uh, um, um, there's going to be a conference photograph. Yeah, you're going to be asked to assemble, uh, uh, appearing at your best for the conference photograph at the end. Okay, Marion, are you still there? 
Yes, I'm still there. <laughs> yeah. Thanks a lot, Mary Ban and Gunnar. This was really great and very interesting talk. Um, I coming from Kurtik Tepe, um, excavating, having excavated there, it's so different. And the people from Ashikli seem so satisfied with themselves. They don't need all these symbols. They just have, it seems to me, their houses, and that's all. So I wonder whether you have some idea from perhaps from the anthropolo anthropological data, whether they were really so isolated and on their own. Is there any evidence for epigen from epigenetic traits or from ADNA that they were really closely parental? If Gunnar says they were isolated, do you have any evidence from that? Uh, I, I, may I? Uh, yes, you may, but we may also ask uh, Mehmet Soma if he's around. Huh? We, we, we have some uh, unpublished, uh, you know, with ancient DNA resources, very, you know, uh, like a secret files, you know. Goodness, goodness, it's on, it's on, the, goodness, the results are online already. No, no, okay. not this one, I just, one. Oh, okay. <laughs> Yeah, so we have very little clue for the Balakla uh, to uh, support our um, interpretation, but uh, already published, you know, you probably follow, uh, as Nigel mentioned, you know, about Ashikla. Uh, we don't know much yet the level uh, two of Ashikla because it's the, the genetic results not really good, as Mehmet can probably answer better than me. But for the earliest levels, we have, uh, uh, we have, uh, uh, how do you call, uh, they are uh, something like a one community, you know, uh, probably in, 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 after like level two, it, it will, it, it will be changed, but in the earliest levels, there, there are, same people. Uh, for epi epigenetic, uh, we don't have the results yet about it. Mehmet Burlardım sen. Bitti. Ben seni arayayım. Bitti o zaman. Okay. Yeah, that, that was a. Uh, okay, hi Mehmet. Hello. Uh, yeah, that was an accurate description. Most of the data comes from uh, the lower levels, and they seem to be pretty genetically homogeneous and uh, not very different from uh, Bonjuklu. Uh, but yeah, the, the data from the uh, upper levels, unfortunately, aren't, uh, well, the, the, the sampling isn't uh, very great yet. I think our gen pool is limited. I feel, I don't know. Yeah, it's, it, yeah, with more, more data, we'll be more comfortable, I guess. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Well, I see no more hands raised for, for questions. I think we can uh, uh, let, let Miraban and Gunesh uh, uh, relax a little now. Oh, no, Eleni's raised her hand. Trevor, Ele oh, Eleni. Eleni. <laughs> Impossible. I, Trevor, I disappeared from your field of view. <laughs> Never disappear from my view, <laughs> Eleni. Uh, yep. Yeah. I just, I think. Doug asked a similar question, and then Marion a similar question. And I have this question in the back of my mind because I raised the same point with Didier's presentation last time. I find the evidence not so much uh, baffling, <laughs> but more perplexing. I think what you're hinting at here is probably a different mode of interaction between communities within central Anatolia that may have certain similarities with what was happening conceptually at least in other parts of the region whereby you may have communities that look completely different to each other yet as Doug said that doesn't necessarily mean that they are not interacting with each other okay Didier talked about last time about how people could adopt ideas, but then render them in their own ways or reject other ideas or 
choose to emphasize their differences precisely because they are interacting with other communities. I think what you start having is probably a different evidence for a different pattern, manner, modus of interaction that may not have been, for example, so dependent on symbolically charged media as what you find at Kyrtik, especially with portable material culture and replete with symbolism. Almost every artifact you pick at this site has a symbol, you know, uh, stamped onto it. And uh, moving to something, a pattern of social interaction that was probably quite different. I found very interesting the, the graphs about plant and animal exploitation. I realized these are very early results from Balikli myself. I think they hint in themselves at more differences, considering especially the late late date of the site uh, compared to Bonsuklu and Ashikli and Pinarbasa as well. There are interesting differences there and I'm, I'm wondering how much we keep looking for similarities and differences in the tra traditional sense of the term, but sometimes we forget the peculiarities of the landscape in itself and how much room the landscape itself would have provided for all these different communities to develop quite specific, if you want, economic practices and associated cultural practices that may mask evidence for greater interactions at the social level. Uh, I have no, I can't, I haven't read yet the genetics paper. I got a notification for it earlier in the morning, but I've been very busy. But I, I took a glimpse at the graph that Mihriban presented. I don't know if you need more data or less data, but I, for myself, I can't believe that every single one of these communities was a strictly inbred community that was not in touch with anybody else, even within central Anatolia, that they were all completely inward looking. So maybe more surveys, more excavations. It is, yes. a, very, it is a very exciting picture. And my, my bet, my gut feeling would be that what you're looking at there is, is, a, is a different, <laughs> pattern of social interaction that's going to be really hard to crack archaeologically in terms of evidence, rather than looking at traditional similarities between material culture or economic practices or symbolic expression and so on. Apologies for the very long statement, full stop and... No, no. I, I, we, I mean, I agree with you. Uh, we have very limited interaction, but I mean, uh, if we compare the regions, you know, there are really, as you call this, greater interaction, you know. So, of course, there is no rule. Do not go there, do not touch them, do not talk with them, something, there's no rule like that, of course. I mean, they use same same sources, they have a limited interaction, but that interaction never, uh, effect uh, or they, the, the, that interaction is not triggering uh, any change in Central Anatolia or in, 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 we can follow in Ashikwe in level four, five, three, and it starts in level, level two and we can follow that interaction, uh, how do you call a scale or speed. Uh, Eleni, I do also agree with you, your comments, I mean, that uh, there is, or there, there were different ways of interactions, there should be different ways of interaction, but whenever we talk about interaction, we always go and think of the interactions fair in East, you know, so uh, 
I mean, the, what, what we have in central Anatolia is different than the, uh, than the communities interacting in the interaction sphere. I think that's, that, that is the, the main... I think on that we can agree completely, Vikri, but <laughs> central Anatolia is different in its own special way. But I wasn't thinking so much about interactions necessarily with other regions, but I was also thinking about the interactions within the central yeah. Anatolia and interaction sphere, <laughs> if yeah. you get my drift here, you know, I mean, I don't know, I, I can again yeah, invite, yeah. invite Douglas yeah. to give us his perspective here, does he really think that the Ponsuclu and Pinarbus people did not interact at all, they never touched each other or... Uh, went close to each other, what do you <laughs> We're getting into very interesting Yeah, I, I, I am <laughs> trying to stop short of getting too interesting here. Uh, you know? Well, as I said, I think the isotope evidence does show that um, at least people came to Bunjukri probably um, from, you know, the Punabasha locality and or spent time in the same location as people from Punabasha. So I think there were people, you know, individuals that came and went and, um, you know, that seems clear. So in that context, it's very interesting that people main, you know, communities maintain these differences, even though individuals are perhaps exchanged, you know, how much they touched each other or not. Uh, sadly, archaeology cannot yet tell us, but um, a reasonable amount, I think we can assume, uh, given how small the houses are, especially at Bunjuklu, you know. Um, yeah, so I think we know that people came and went. The interesting thing is how they responded to, you know, the possibilities for interaction and adoption. You know, as Ganesh and Miraban have, have said, you know, I guess Emma is somehow being introduced at some point. So there are wider, you know, contexts of introduction. Marine shells are moving, you know, between areas, between communities. It, it must be between communities. We take the Konya Plain isotope evidence because we can see, you know, as far as you know, we can see that not many people are going very far away from the plain in a group as groups anyway. So presumably, therefore, both obsidian and seashells are passing through intermediate communities, you know, to get to, to places like Bunjuk Clue and, and Punavash. And people must be meeting somewhere for that to happen, whether it's at each other's settlements or in the landscape, potentially. So there's I think there's lots of actual contact going on. And then people are making an interesting set of choices about what they, you know, copy or share and what they don't copy and, and, and share, which is, you know, the really interesting thing. So if they're, if they're meeting some of Didier's Levantine influence nappers, for example, um, they're not, you know, learning from them or they, they're not interested in learning from them or what, whatever it, it, it might be. But we do see things, some things shared. So we've got, you know, let's call them, Jaffa points um, after um, after Ganesh's you know statement. We've got Jaffa points, for example, at Punabasha and Bonjukli. So that's a you know a shared response that people are picking up. So it's interesting what's selected and what isn't. Anyway, that's enough for me. Again, I I'm sure. I think I think I think we we need to interact with Central Anatolian archaeologists, Douglas. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I'm all in favour of a really good get together at some point in the not too distant future, Ganesh. Hopefully this summer, you know. <laughs> okay. Nigel, do, do you want to add something? Nigel. Hi everyone. Um, yeah, I, I mean. The exciting thing about Balikli, I think, is that um, 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 the differences with the Shikli, even, even though it's more or less, I mean, it has to be more or less co contemporary with the, the lower levels of, of uh, the Shikli, are, um, are so different in many respects. Although, when you look at the, for instance, at the lithics, um, um, uh, Norshan can correct me here, but uh, I mean, there's both uh, bi-directional, but it's not really naviform in any sense of the word. Um, but it, but it's basically um, single platform, um, um, fairly narrow fronted, 
uh, for the blade bladelets that seem to be on a um, um, seem seem to form a single group rather than two separate groups. Uh, there's no bimodality there, um, but but. The technology is basically epipaleolithic, as is much of the uh, of the lithic assemblages. Um, quite quite different from what you've got the other side of the uh, uh, of the torus, with the exception of of uh, Guludang, of course. Um, but but there's the difference is both in terms of architectural features and there are various other architectural features that seem to be different between Balikli and, and uh, Ashikli. Um, and, and the wealth of uh, beads and so on uh, at Balikli in comparison to uh, Ashikli uh, and also differences in the lithics. Um, I think are really quite, uh, quite, quite serious, uh, especially since uh, it's basically half a day's walk uh, from Mashikli to Balikli. Um, very, very easy uh, access from one to the other. Um, but this whole idea of separate identities in terms of the material culture um, I think it's really quite fascinating. Um, but we're also beginning to pick up on such things. If, if you look at some of Southern Jordan, uh, some of the differences, uh, in, both in architecture and other elements, um, which are also uh, quite noticeable lately. I mean, from the talk uh, by Marion um, a, few, a few weeks back, um, so I, I, I think it's becoming much more interesting in terms of uh, the whole idea of connections or non-connections between groups which apparently viewed themselves being very different from one another, even if, as Doug said before, um, they're ultimately all part of the same gene pool and, and, and so on. Um, but it, for me, it's been a fascinating uh, experience of learning a totally different geographic area uh, from what I've previously been um, aware of. Thank you. Okay, I think we're at the end of uh, questions and discussion, much to the relief, I'm sure, of Mirabar Baron and Chris, but please don't go away. Because you're can I say something for a photograph, Trevor? Can I say, say something first? Go so ahead. we are um, again and again is, is grateful to uh, Trevor Watkins. Uh, uh, so he introducing us, uh, so many of you and you to us. Uh, we hope to see you in uh, second round. Uh, we'll be. Uh, announced it soon. Uh, many of them will be uh, there as a lecture. Uh, so second round is dedicated to memory of uh, Ofer Bar Yosef. Uh, please uh, 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 follow our web pages or YouTube pages as we, we, we are going to announce soon uh, the program. Okay, now we okay, can- so don't, don't go away, there's a photograph, but just before we go to the photograph, I want to say personally to Miriban and, and uh, uh, Gunesh, thank you so much for the honor you've, you've, you've done me. It's been the most wonderful experience. And there's been a whole stream of people not only saying thank you in the, in the chats for this lecture, but thank you for the series. I think all of us are, are uh, enormously grateful for your unique experiment with something which has been so very, very successful. Congratulations and thank you very much indeed. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. you can't hear the applause. <laughs> Seda and Miris, can you take photos? Yes, yes, of course. And please tell us whenever you're ready. 
so that we stop smiling. <laughs> <laughs> so we can go, so we can go home. <laughs> I took few, uh, the first four pages or something. So relax. <laughs> We are relaxed. I'm also taking. Okay. Me too. All right. <laughs> so, unfortunately, we don't have any party option. And I've, I've finished my glass of wine too. Okay, I have water this time. <laughs> It's a pity. <laughs> thank you for everyone. Uh, thank, thank you. Thank, thank you for you. participating. Uh, see you uh, in the next round. Yeah. yeah. Thank, thank you very much. Bye. Bye. Thank you very thank much. You. Bye. 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 Bye.